I'm Dalton Roberts, and I'm the pastor of Parkway Baptist Church in Trinity, Alabama. And I'm here in Webster, New York at the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church, and we're having a wonderful time with Pastor Jack Young. And we are having a biblical preaching workshop. We have uh, hosted numerous biblical preaching workshops, had a couple at our church in Alabama, and we've had one up in two, I think, up in Maine. And so it's a new thing that we're doing, and I'm very excited about it. It is our goal to encourage preachers not only to determine to preach the Word of God, to preach sermons that are shaped by the Scripture, where the Scripture is the sermon, but it is our goal to, to, to do some teaching and to provide some information, some extended education in the subject, in the area of biblical preaching, trying to be an encouragement to preachers, pastors, missionaries in the area of the most important work that we do, and that is preaching the Bible. I mean, we're having a great time here. We have James Knox from DeLand, Florida. There's not a better preacher anywhere than Brother Knox, and man, he has really fed us and encouraged us in the Word of God. And so I hope you'll enjoy these videos, and they will give you an indication of what we're trying to do. We, we don't have all the answers. We are just trying to share some good information. And we do believe, it is our conviction, that if preaching is not biblical, I don't mean using the Bible, but if it is not shaped by the Scripture, if the Word of God in its context is not the point of the preaching, it's not biblical preaching. And we hope that this will be an encouragement to you, and maybe you can look up one of our uh, workshops in the future and attend, and we hope it would be a blessing to you. Testing, testing, we on, sis? Good. There we go. All right, come gather around. See if that coffee works. Turn with me to Second Chronicles seven, a verse that you know. Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen, which would be nice if it was written about the United States, except it's not, but it's still a good verse. But, but I want to read I want to read you the verse and then a cross reference. So, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And you, we've heard that verse. We've seen it on posters and, and, and wall plaques and, and other things. Now, with that verse in mind, look at Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. If my people... <coughs> humble themselves and pray and so forth. Jeremiah 23, look at verse 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. How is that for a cross-reference? If my people had humble themselves and pray, I'd heal their land. And in Jeremiah, God says, if my preachers would have given them the word of God, they would have humbled themselves and prayed. God lays the responsibility on the preacher, not on the nation. So may the Lord help us uh, in, in that regard. Father, help me in this hour. Be a blessing to your, uh, these men and women gathered together here today. And lead us and guide us in some truth that help us be help to others. We ask in Jesus' name, and Amen. Uh, let, let's let's say this. We've heard of sinners in the hands of an angry God, John, uh, Colonial America sermon. Uh, we, you you might have heard of uh, God's three deadlines, J. Harold Smith. You've probably listened to Brother Roloff preach Doctor Law and Doctor Grace. Harold Seitler, God can. I'm not going to tell you there is not one great life-changing sermon that God's going to drop on you and that Sunday morning will change the lives of everyone in your church. That sermon doesn't exist. It's not there. I, 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 want, to, I want to give a, comp a comparison. My, my sister is a second grade teacher. She'd been teaching second grade in public schools for 30 plus years. 
she spends her summer putting together nine months of lesson plans in hopes that she can bring seven-year-olds from point A to point B in a year. That's one year out of 12. 12 years to get a child ready for a career. 12 years to get a child ready to either go on to college and master a subject or go out in the world and earn a living and provide for a family. Now, since I was a child in public school, she now has to deal with so many St. Patrick's Days and Halloweens and Martin Luther King Day and transgender awareness and indoctrination and all the rest of that, that she can't give the children the time that she needs to give them to get them from point A to point B. And that happens in the first grade, in the second grade, in the third grade, and by the twelfth grade, we're graduating boys and girls that can't read and can't write and can't do mathematics, but they've been well entertained and they've had a lot of fun and they believe in themselves. <laughs> now, we ridicule that, but that, that philosophy and approach has infected our churches. We don't have a lesson plan. We don't have a one-year plan. We don't have a 12-year point of reference. How can we have, we have, and I, I'm, I'm not being critical, you have one, we have them. We have our dinners and we have our special events and we have our occasions, but brother, this is March. What are you planning to do to make your people better educated biblical Christians a year from now than they are today? Hope you have good music. I think you do. We have good music. Praise the Lord. It's a help. We have good fellowship and lots of activities for people to fellowship and get to, uh, and get to know each other. That's great. But if 12 years from now, the people who have attended our church are as biblically illiterate as they were when they came as first graders, that's a lack of long-sighted preparation on our part. I can't teach a child to read in a week. I can't teach somebody who grew up out in the world how to be a godly man or a godly woman in three sermons. No matter how dynamic they are, no matter how great they are, no matter whether or not, as the, the phrase is used, God got in it. Well, God might have got in it. And that person that, that got moved, and whether you have an altar calls or not, we're not talking about any of those things this week, but that man hears that sermon, and God touches his heart, and he takes his wife by the hand, and they come down there, and they kneel and pray. They don't even know what to pray. God, I'm sorry, I want to be a better husband. Okay, fine, me too. That doesn't provide that man the information that he needs to be a better husband or that woman the information she needs to be a better husband. So the reason we want to not have this moving of the Holy Ghost in the shower on Saturday night with the nugget for the week and the reason we're not looking for more people to come to the altar during the invitation than last week is that's an immediate, short-term, emotional, good time. Like a Thanksgiving party in fifth grade. Wow, we dressed up like pilgrims and we dressed up like, I started to say Indians, I'm so sorry, uh, Native Americans. And, and, you know, we had the big powwow and, and, and the, uh, you know, the Indian chief stood up and told us, you white people are bad. And, and you know, it's, we had a big time and, and a good day in school. But nobody learned anything. And so you look at your society and you say, we have failed our nation by not requiring our children to work hard and to learn. Well, we're failing our, our Christianity by not requiring people to step it up and to learn. I don't think a child in school will do any more than is required of them. I wouldn't have. Teacher, can I have homework, please? 
Are you kidding? <laughs> teacher, can we do more tests so I have to study harder? No. But the teachers that required that of me greatly advanced my education. And the teachers who didn't wasted my time. People come to church, they don't know what's expected of them. They'll learn that from you. And if you tell them nothing's expected of them, they'll hit that mark pretty easy. Really. You say, well, you know, kids not, today, they just don't know how to learn. Well, adults nowadays just don't know how to learn. That's your job. So expository preaching, I'm going to talk more this afternoon about going through a book of the Bible, and, and as Brother Dalton said, it's not required, but, but I'm going to tell you something. It's good to have lesson plans. Yeah. It's good to have a long-term objective. It's good to have first-grade material, second-grade material, third-grade material. Amen. And God's kind of laid that out for us in the Bible. Yes. In these epistles that God gave the church, in the cross-references that run from them, we have an opportunity to take people from zero to doctorate degree, yes. but it might take 15 years. It's not going to happen in a year. So, so listen, let, let's go back in time when, uh, when you're, you're, uh, some of you are my age and, and, and it's a different time. When we knocked on doors in 1976, 77, I started, I got saved December 76. When we knocked on doors in 1977, nine out of ten people behind that door knew the Bible was the Word of God Jesus was the only way to heaven, and without Jesus, they were going to hell. They just hadn't yet been convinced they need to trust Christ today. Right. You knock on doors today, they don't, know what, they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. They don't believe Jesus is the way to heaven. One's a Buddhist, one's a Hindu, one's a Muslim, one's a tree hugger. One's a... It's a different country. It's a different world. When... When men got saved in the 1950s, 1960s, and these Oliver Green revivals, and they bless God, Oliver Green set up a tent, they preached for six weeks, three churches were started, six men called to preach. All those were working, God-fearing men, ex-military, women who carried their family through a Great Depression, a Second World War. They were men and women with character and biblical principles before they got saved. My father lived a Christian life before he came to know Christ as his Savior because that's how men were taught to live. You understand what I'm saying? Today, if you lead a man to Christ 35 years old, you got to be his daddy. You got to teach him how to get dressed, how to get to church on time, how to not curse and swear and how to stand up straight. I'm just telling you, there's no, there's no, there's no foundation anymore. So the idea that, wow, we got some people saved and they're coming to church and they join the church, you know what you got? You, um, respectfully, you just got some new first graders. They just got off the bus and it's first grade and you got to teach them the alphabet. You got to teach them numbers. My mother had us reading before we went to first grade. Now the goal in our, in our government schools in Florida, the goal is to have every child able to read by the end of the fourth grade. Yeah, right. What if they can't? Well, we don't hurt their feelings. We're just going to pass them on. Yeah. Well, you know something? You've got people in your church been there five years, and, and when you say turn to Jeremiah, they can't find it. That's not all on them. We're supposed to be teaching them. So I'll tell you, to give you an example. So we had a, a, a young lady um, and came to, came to church two or three times and never heard, never heard the gospel in her life, didn't know anything about the Bible, and got saved, got saved. And I'm teaching through 1 Corinthians, and we get to chapter number 5 about fornicators not supposed to be in the church. You get married or... See you later. That's this young woman comes. She is she is sobbing. She is sobbing, and she said, "I, 
I never knew. Nobody ever told me this. I didn't know it was wrong. I've got nowhere to go. She said, please give me time and I'll make this right. Wow. Now you think about something. You grew up in America, broken home, unsafe parents, public school, TV, movies. Who in, in her life had ever told her, you're not supposed to be living with somebody you're not married to? Yeah, that's right. if, she went to if she went to most churches in our town, she still wouldn't know that. Now, at the risk of offending people, you have to educate them biblically or you're going to be giving diplomas to 18-year-old to kids who don't know how to read. Great. Yes. It's not our job to have a great wow swinging from the chandeliers service every Sunday morning. It's our job to educate people in the Word of God and teach them how to live, and they don't know how to live. They don't. They know nothing about being a father, nothing about being a mother, nothing about holding a job, nothing about work ethic. Where are they going to get that? From the Bible. Not if we don't teach all the Bible. If we just preach sermons that are designed to make everybody have a big time, we're leaving them. The kids are having a big time at school. <laughs> but they're not learning anything. People have a big time at church, but they're not learning anything. Now, your challenge is even greater because you're teaching in a one-room school. You got first grade through 12th grade, and you got to minister to all of them at the same time. Now, what better way to do that then just take a letter that God wrote to a church and go through that letter point by point. There's going to be something there for the brand new Christian. There's going to be something there for the man that's been saved 50 years. There's going to be something there for the person that's about to fall out the door. There's going to be something there for the person that's, that's just on fire for God. So I, I believe that expositional preaching, verse by verse, line by line, precept by precept, with a long-term plan is the most beneficial for your church. Now, that's, that's opinion, but I've been brought here to give, <laughs> give some opinion, and, and that's an opinion. It, when, when I ask guys, they, they come and, and they say, we're on deputation, and, and, and we come pre present our work. I, try, I really do. I try to sit down with these guys and say, listen, okay, you're going to go to, to Borneo, or you're going to go to Peggy Peggy, or wherever you're going. Five years from now, what do you want to have accomplished? Ten years from now, what do you want to have accomplished? And you'd be amazed at how many of them just give you a blank look because all they've thought about is how much money we need to raise to get there. Get there to do what? Get there to accomplish what? Well, we're going to go to Kansas and we're going to start a church. Great. There's plenty of towns in Kansas that don't have a church. How are you going to start? Well, we're going to go there and start a church. Where? You're going to rent a building? You're going to buy an old church building? Got some money saved up? You're going to meet in your house? I don't know. Okay, when you get the building, five years, what's the plan? Ten years, what's the plan? Well, I don't know. You start a restaurant like that, you're going bankrupt. You start a hardware store like that, you're going belly up and you're going to owe money for 40 years to somebody. Right. Come on, guys. Have a plan. Hey. I'm going to preach an Old Testament book and I'm going to preach a New Testament book. I'm going to preach a, 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 an epistle and then I'm going to preach a gospel. I'm going, to, I'm going to systematically go through the person and work of Jesus Christ. I'm going to go through some end time prophecy sprinkled in here and there. What's the plan? I, 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 I'm not old enough to have been involved in the whole Southern Baptist, Independent Baptist controversy, but I know this. I know there were a lot of great Southern Baptist churches that won souls and sent out missionaries and did great things for God. 
But if all you hear is soul winning Sunday morning and attend on Sunday night and tithe on midweek service and the next week it's soul winning Sunday morning or get saved and, and tithe on Sunday night and attend on midweek service, you're going to turn out and be a bunch of carnal babies, man. Because you just don't know anything about the Bible. And, and, and we're starting to follow that model in our independent churches. You got your favorite topics, I got my favorite topics, and we just hammer them and hammer them and hammer them, and that's, it's, that's not a good education. Right. It's not a good, a good working model. So let me show you something here uh, in, the, in our uh, session. Come to Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter 2, I'm going to show you a guy who just winged it. He just, God got on him, and he just got up and preached, and, and the Lord really blessed it. You know this story, Acts chapter 2? So verse number 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The two greatest miracles in the New Testament. I'll give a sermon away. You want a, you want a free sermon? Here's a free sermon. Two greatest miracles in the New Testament. The resurrection of Christ. And in Acts 1, they had a vote on the replacement for Judas Iscariot. And they were so divided on who the next apostle was going to be, they ended up throwing dice. <laughs> Seven and up, it's Matthias. Six and under, it's the other guy. And they threw the dice against the wall. It's, and in chapter 2, verse 1, everybody's still there and still in one accord. That's the greatest miracle since the resurrection. <laughs> I mean, th you really, think about it. Nobody got mad and left. They're, they're not about the guy being the assistant pastor. He was that close to being an apostle. <laughs> twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And that one die kept spinning and it fell on four instead of two. And he... <laughs> so you think that's how they did it? I don't know, but they cast lots. That's what it says. Short, short straw or something. Anyway, so they're in the upper room. Down comes the Holy Ghost and... and they're all, they're all filled with the Spirit, and out they go onto the street, and, and the Bible says in verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. So Peter and these other apostles run out of the upper room under the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and Peter just starts preaching. Verses 16 to 21 is the Bible. Joel, what an odd place to start. But he preaches in verses 16 to 21 from Joel and, and gives an explanation to the people. You say we're drunk, we're not drunk. Here's the reference showing what the Holy Spirit does to men when he, when he comes upon them. That's what's happening here. Then in verses 22 to 24, he proclaims what Christ did. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus now just proved of God. Uh, miracles, wonders, signs. Verse 23, you crucified him. Verse 24, God raised him from the dead. So Peter preaches the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Verses 25 to 28, more Bible. Oh, you don't believe in a resurrection? Well, what did David say in the Psalms? And he wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about Christ. Bible, Bible, Bible. Verse 29, the explanation of the Bible. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He's both dead and buried. His sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, cord and flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. His soul is not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Praise the Lord. And then in verses 33 to 36, he exalts Christ. So Peter, under the power of the Holy Ghost, just preaches Bible explanation for what happened to them. Then this is what Christ did for all of us. Bible explanation for Christ rising from the dead. Then lifts up Jesus Christ 
and souls get saved, praise the Lord. So I have a Bible pattern. If you want to just wing it, get filled with the Holy Ghost and go out there and preach the gospel to lost people. This is not a model for teaching and pastoring in a New Testament church. This is the model for God sending you out into the world to proclaim the gospel to unsaved people. And they got saved, praise the Lord. So, you know, I got to really get ready to go out there and preach on the street. Really? People are going to listen to you for one minute. <laughs> Tell them what Christ did for them, what he did for you. Lift him up. That's all you can do. And hope the Lord blesses people get saved. In fact, look what happens here. The Bible says in verse number uh, uh, 40, with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves in this untoward generation. Uh, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now wait, verse 42 they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and of prayers. And fear came upon every soul. Verse 44, uh, all that believed were together, had all things common, sold their possessions, goods, parted them to all men as every man had need. They continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness, single heart, praising God and having favor with all people. Now watch. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. When spirit-filled believers preach simplicity, preach in power, preach Christ to lost people, the church grows numerically. Praise the Lord. All right, look at the end of uh, chapter Number four, end of chapter four, verse uh, 33. Great power gave the apostles witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, great grace upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the price of those things which were sold, laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made. So that's the second time you read that. Chapter six, verse one. And in those days, so what days? The days when lots of people are getting saved and they are living vol voluntarily communally. It's not a government mandate. It's not a church mandate. It's a voluntary sacrificing of their material possessions so that, that people uh, aren't, aren't doing without. Why is that not an American church doctrine, but why was it practiced then? Are you kidding? You're going to convert from Judaism to Christianity? You're going to deny the Roman gods and become a Christian? Guess who's not employed? Guess who may lose their home? You live in three generations at a time under one roof and you come home and say, Dad, Grandpa, I became a Christian. Out you go. So this isn't required by God. It's not commanded by God. It's a heart's response to a real need, a real situation. Um, Brother Barkowski spent 10 years. We went over there 12 years ago and... and uh, got that church kicked off in Thessalonica in Greece. You don't get a birth certificate for your child until you pay the priest to baptize your baby. You can't enroll in public school without paying the priest to sign off on you getting the education. As a man, you can't, you can't have a career. You're going to renounce the Greek Orthodox religion and stand up, stand up for Jesus. And it costs you nothing to get saved in America. Yeah. But in a lot of this world, it's going to cost you dearly. So in those days, people are getting saved and losing everything they've got. And they're helping one another to survive. 
Praise the Lord. So watch, watch what happened. In those days, when the number of disciples is multiplied, thank God for that, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. This is great, guys. You want to be a pastor? You want to be a pastor? Praise God, I'm called to preach. Then go preach and have fun. Being a pastor is an entirely different animal. 3,000 people got saved. Then another 2,000 people got saved. They're meeting daily. They're following the apostles' doctrine. They... And now there's a fight because when we have dinner on the grounds, the first 50 people in line pile their plate up like the Tower of Babel and get all the fried chicken. And the people at the end of the line, nothing left but the vegetables. And the people griping the most of the people that never bring anything. <laughs> yeah, you understand? Now, nothing's changed. They're getting free meals. But one group of ladies are getting treated in their perception better than the other group of ladies. And you know what? It doesn't matter that 5,000 souls have been saved. It doesn't matter that Christ is risen from the dead. By the time I get through the line, my beans are cold. <laughs> Come on, guys. This is, this is the real world. And so the, the Scripture says, uh, verse number 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, Now, now watch, this. it's going to be a hard sell to your church, but, but we're in the Bible here. It is not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. And this is your challenge, brother. This is your challenge. To gracefully, not with an attitude, to gracefully help your church understand there's things you can do to make all of this run. And if I do them, you're not getting Bible preaching on Sunday. That's good. That's right. Good. Yeah, that's great. You know what they said? We need to feed these people. These people need to be fed. These people need to be cared for. We need somebody to buy the food, prep the food, cook the food, serve the food, and clean up afterwards, but it can't be us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, you start a church, you're going to have to do everything. Five years, ten years, your wife will be the, she'll do the nursery, she'll do the Sunday school, she'll clean the building. You'll, you'll do it all. You'll cut the grass. Okay, I, I get that. But you have to understand that everything you can delegate, you should delegate. And everything that keeps you from the Word of God is keeping you from doing what you're supposed to do in that church that nobody else in that church is equipped to do or gifted to do. Is that okay? Yes. Wherefore, brethren... Look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. We're not talking about just grab anybody and give them a job to do. God said, my church is so important, I want people filled with the Holy Ghost peeling the potatoes. I want people filled with the Holy Ghost mopping the kitchen afterward. Why? The problem here is not a lack of food. It's contention. The problem here is not a lack of supplies. The problem here is attitude and pride. Well, putting proud people and people with an attitude in there to deal with proud people and people with an attitude is just going to set the bomb off. So what do we need? We need someone in that serving line saying, Praise the Lord, sister. It's great to see you. It's a, ha, praise the Lord. It's great. And now, you, now you, let, let me get this right. Are, are, are you a Hebrew lady or a, a Grecian lady? Because we've got beans and we've got pork and beans. And we just, just which, which one what, would you like? You don't need somebody at line saying, oh, another griping Jew, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right? So everybody in our church needs to be doing something. But the first thing they need to be is filled with the Holy Ghost. Good. Good. So you need to find as many people as you can with a good heart to do as many things as they can do to free you to spend time with the Word of God. 
Some of, the, some, of, some of the men I envy the most in the ministry are just wonderful pastors. But they are such wonderful pastors, their preaching and teaching suffers because of it. I'm not a, I'm, I think I've got a good heart. I think I love people. If you call me and say, I'm going into labor, I'm going to the hospital, I will pray for you. But I can't deliver babies. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we got a big church. If I spend all week at the hospital or all week chit-chatting over coffee or all week watching your kids play Little League, I'm going to have to get a bolt of inspiration on Saturday night with a sermon in it. Yeah. Why? I've neglected the word of God in order to serve tables. And the Bible says that's not reasonable. And you gotta get you gotta wrap your heart around that, and you gotta get your church to wrap their heart around that. If I can't labor in the word, I can't I can't get you from first grade to graduation. We're gonna all stay in the first grade. Keep going here. Uh, verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, not golf and fishing. Yep. Amen. Yep. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, what, what does that suggest to you? That it takes more than 10 minutes to come up with three good sermons for the week. Yeah. It is a continual process. Is it for you? All right, now here, here's what, I, I said all that because I wanted to get to this. The saying pleased the whole multitude, like the pastor of that church, <laughs> and, they, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and uh, Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So here's another thing I want to tell you about preaching. When you come to these names, just say them confidently any way you want to. <laughs> and so, oh, yeah, that's how you pronounce that. <laughs> don't slow down. Don't just, just throw it out there. <laughs> is that how you say that? It is today. <laughs> well, Scorby didn't say it that way. Well, what does he know? <laughs> He's just an actor. <laughs> All right, and, and so here's something real interesting, and, and we're, we'll talk about this some more tonight, I think, but as you encourage your church and as you teach your church and as, you, as you're building a congregation, not just preaching sermons, I wonder how many preachers there were by this time in, in, the, in the history of our, of our church. Yet these men got their names in the Bible for serving lunch so the preacher could study the Bible. God must have thought it was really important for somebody to shoulder a workload that promoted the unity of the church and freed the pastor to labor in the Word. Now, guys, this is an attitude thing. I know we're talking about preaching, but this is an attitude thing. If you put yourself here and put what you're doing for God here and put everybody else down here and what they're doing for God down here, why would they do it? Yeah. The more you exalt yourself, the more you're going to have to do everything because you've convinced the rest of the church they're not really all that necessary. Yeah. The only thing they need to do is come and listen to you. <laughs> well, I thought we, I didn't think we were Catholics. You know, it would be great if everybody that was doing something for God in our churches knew that's so important, God's writing a book about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there they are. Well, who's Nicanor? I never heard of him. God put him in the Bible. Yeah. Very good. When, when Paul left Philippi, who, who pastored that church? I don't know. We got a, we got uh, two letters uh, or uh, s seven letters in the uh, in Book of Revelation written to local churches. Uh, Timothy was in Ephesus. I don't know who's at the other six churches. Do you? 
Well, here's the names of guys that freed the preacher up to study the Word of God. Amen. And Lord put their names in the Bible. So let's, let's do it this way. My job's important. Your job's important. Your job's important. If you do your job for me, I can do my job for you, and God's church will work better. Verse 6, whom they set before the apostles when they had prayed and laid their hands on them. <laughs> That's something. God bless this man and his family as they go out on the mission field. God bless this young man and his family as they go out to start a church. God bless this man and his family as they take on the duties of mowing the yard and trimming the hedge. God bless these ladies as they volunteered to clean the restrooms every Monday. They're laying hands on guys and ordaining them to the ministry of serving lunch. You know what? It helps us if people realize ours isn't the only important part of the church. But if I have to do all the parts, I can't do my part. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting to the part about preaching, honestly. Verse 7. And the word of God increased. Now look what happens here. And I'm not making light of it. Praise the Lord. In Acts chapter 2, a man full of the Holy Ghost wings it. God gets on him. He's excited. He lifts up his voice. He preach, preaches Christ. And a bunch of people get saved. That kind of enthusiastic, heartfelt preaching can increase a church numerically. But it takes the devoted, dedicated study of the scriptures for a church to increase spiritually. See the, you see the, the distinction? Now let's talk about these modern rock and roll churches and and uh, most of us don't have to worry about skinny jeans. We can't wear skinny anything. But so, so, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's not so much a conviction as a necessity. Anyway, <clears throat> dynamic preachers excited about Jesus who truly care about people who don't make any demands on their congregation are growing very large churches. Yes. And I think a lot of them are, are saved people doing the best they know how because they love the Lord and they love people. And if you disagree with that, that's okay. That's okay. Mo most of us preach uh, about people and say things about people we've never met and never talked to. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> right. Oh, those church preachers, and you know how many of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've had lunch with, with which one? So I'm not saying they're good guys. I'm, I'm just saying I don't think they're all the devil. But if you talk to the people going to their churches, there's no spiritual growth. There's no depth. There's no improvement in their lives. And they're pretty happy in Jesus, but clueless. I'll, I'll tell you a story if I have time. So I want us to have their enthusiasm. I want us to have their zeal for getting people to Christ. I want us to actually let people know we love and care about them. And if we increase numerically, we don't want to leave people where Christ found them. We want the Word of God to increase, not just have our numbers increase. Well, what's necessary for that? We've got to quit doing all these little piddly things that take us away from studying the Bible. We've got to quit all this busy work that's occupying so much of our time that we can't get the food, the lesson plan, the preparation from God's Word that is necessary to bring these people from first grade to graduation. Is, is that fair? And I'll talk to you after lunch about a little bit more about the preparation. So this man, uh, 
we've had so many men through the years whose wives made them leave our church because I'm, I'm just, I'm so mean. But, but this fellow came, he said, he said, preacher, I need to come meet with you. I need to come see you. I said, okay, fine. And uh, he brought his wife with him. And he said, I got a real problem. He said, the church I go to, it's a, it's a uh, Southern Baptist church. They don't call it church anymore. It's the, you know, they all have names now, the couch, the, the sofa, the pajamas, the, the, the river, all that. Anyway, and he said, he said, we got 3,000 people coming on Sunday morning. He said, we have 49 staff members. Six of our staff members are living with people they're not married to. Three of our staff members are, are homosexuals. And he said, I don't know what to do about it. And I said, brother, you, you do something about it every time you go. You support it. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's good. You participate in it. He said, no, brother. He said, I, I, I just, I think it's all wrong. He said, but our pastor, he's such a loving man. He's such a, such a, a great man. I, I hate to hurt his feelings. And I said, I know you'd rather sit in the gate of Sodom than offend what's going on there. His wife turned to him and said, I told you he'd say that. <laughs> and I smiled, looked at her and I said, I appreciate that. Now listen. That man, by his own admission, his pastor loves the Lord and loves people. But he doesn't love the Word of God. And this man is troubled that there are staff members on his church. Now, why are they staff members? Because of their level of dedication to whoever they think Jesus is, but not to his Word. Now, wouldn't it be great to have 3,000 people on Sunday? But if you're going to teach this book, you can't have those 3,000 people or those 3,000 people can't continue to be the people that they are. So here's what, here's what you have to decide. Do I want to be successful numerically and spiritually or am I content to be successful numerically? Well, the Lord had to be really thrilled with 5,000 people saved in the first five chapters of the book of Acts. He had to be thrilled with that. But he wasn't content with that. He wanted those saved people to become Christians. True followers of biblical doctrine. And that was the responsibility of the men who weren't more important than those serving tables, but the men whom God had gifted and selected to study the word, dig out the truth in prayer, and then bring those people from enrollment to graduation. Brother, I really believe that's our job. I want to see souls saved. Our church, we, we do public ministry uh, four, four times a week. We do door knocking. We have uh, multiple nursing home services. Uh, we're in all kinds of prisons. We're in, we're in several uh, public schools. And, and I hardly participate in any of that. Why? When would I put together what those people got that resulted in all of that effort and work for Christ. We're not doing all of that because I'm doing all of that. We're doing all of that because I've been able to do what God gave me to do. See? And if your church is a one-man ministry, it's only going as far as you can take it. But if your church becomes an everyone ministry, there's no limit to how far it can go. But we can't just have a bunch of clueless first graders. We've got to have a program of, of systematic year after year after year teaching and training so people can, look, it's, it's just great. The word of God increased. Acts 2, just winging it. Good sermon, God, quote unquote, God was in it. Souls got so the church grew. 
But when men devoted themselves to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God and didn't do unreasonable things instead of studying the Bible, the Word of God increased in the lives of the people in that church. Okay? So I want, you to grow, I want your church to grow. But I don't want your church to be full of 17-year-olds who can't add and subtract. Okay? So what's the plan, guys? From where This is March. Next March, what will your congregation have learned? Where, what, what, where, what, do you, what do you plan to impart to them over the course of the next year? It's, it's not all on a heretic. When people can sit in our church for 10 years and watch one online video and think they're going through the tribulation. Somebody hadn't been taught. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that's all on us, but let's make sure none of it's on us. What are people supposed to believe? Have I given them that information? Have I explained it to them? Have I gone over it frequently enough for them to pass an exam? <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll, we'll hit on, uh, Lord willing, in the afternoon session, uh, I'll cover two things. One, why you never want to preach after lunch. And, <laughs> and two, some of what's involved in this, this study and, and preparation work. So, all right, Pastor.